Stuart A. McMillan. Who is Stuart A. McMillan? Most know him as the president of the infamous company Modern Nature, also known as Monate, a multi-level marketing company that got its start by selling overpriced hair care. But there are other titles that he holds that many don't know about. And I'm here to talk about those alleged titles and what happened. Hey, hello, I'm Julie Jo. Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Feel free to hit the like button if you enjoy the video. Hit the subscribe button if you want to subscribe to my channel. And hit the bell button if you want to get notified when I post. If you're not new here, welcome back. Today we are going to take a look at the president of Monet Global, some call it Monet, some call it Monet, Stuart A. McMillan. Before we get into this, don't forget to go follow my Instagram and my TikTok. They are walkin underscore on underscore Lexapro. My TikTok is back up and feel free to go down to my description. They are all down there as well as my affiliate link for any candles and wax melts that you might want, especially if you're trying to move away from MLM and especially Scentsy. Those are good options. Feel free to click the link down there and take a look. Let's talk about Stuart. Stuart is the president of Monate Global or Modern Nature or Monet or Monate, whatever you want to call it. He has been the president since September 2014 to now, which is about seven years and seven months. On the Monate website, it says a natural leader and motivator, Stuart brings nearly 30 years of management experience to Monet with a heavy emphasis on direct selling. His role at Monet includes team building, strategic marketing, and business development initiatives, all with the goal of enabling market partners to be financially independent and debt free. If you're not sure what an MLM is, it's a multi-level marketing company. And as the FTC says, and the AARP says, these are not great opportunities to make an income. The AARP says that 75 to 99% of people who actually join these companies don't make a profit. I'll link all my resources below so you can go read them and take a look at them. The reason I'm wanting to take a look at Stuart McMillan, the president, is because while yes, it is important to look at top leaders, it is important to look at the companies, it is important to talk about the business structure, it's important to talk about all that, show the manipulation tactics and whatnot with everything. But these people enable this and they know what's going on and they have skeletons in their closet that i think it's important to show how could someone like this be running an mlm company why would they allow someone like this to run a company like monet or a company in general before we get started please know that a lot of this is going to be from my standpoint my opinion it is alleged some of it is just fact and i will show the facts and i will show my opinions with those facts so we are going to go ahead and get started and talk about monet and stuart mcmillan with a quick indeed search we see that he has a lot of management experience which is no surprise and not only has he been in Monate for many years, he was also in Arbonne for over four years as head of sales and marketing and president in Canada. And then the head of sales was in the US. Another company that is a multi-level marketing company that he was a part of other than Arbonne, which if you don't know much about Arbonne, I do have a few videos of it. I was in Arbonne and was qualified for the top 2% of the company. Feel free to click up here. I will put a card that you can click, watch my story and watch other videos of Arbonne but he was a president of Immunotech. Immunotech is, like I said, multi-level marketing company, and he was a part of Immunotech as the president for a year and seven months. Here's where it shows to become a consultant. You get 30% discount, be a part of exclusive incentive with the whole Immunotech family, start your own Immunotech business, and so on and so forth, as well as their products. It reminds me a lot of Arbonne in the sense of health and wellness. It comes to immunity stuff. It comes to cognitive boosts. Um, their starter packs range from $500 to well over $1,100. And it's just expensive in general. But we're not here to talk about Immunotech. I just want to show that he does have prior direct selling experience and a lot of his experience is direct selling and management. This is a two part series. So we are currently doing part one right now, watching the part one. And next will be part two, where we are going to watch a Stuart McMillan training, break it down and give reaction and commentary to it. We're going to see a lot of contradiction. And I think it's important to get through part one before we go to part two. 
On his experience when it comes to Money Global, it says it is a wholly owned subsidiary of Alcora Corporate. Mr. McMillan helped to co-found Money in 2014 to enter the multi-million multi-billion dollar hair care market. Since its launch, Money has won a number of American business awards, including Startup of the Year and Best Organization under $100 million in its early years. Most recent in 2020, winning Think Global's Brand of the Year and the American Business Awards Company of the Year, which are all multi-level marketing direct sales awards. In 2018, Monet was re recognized as the fastest growing company in the direct selling industry and last year ranked number 24 in the world while ranking at number 62 of all health and beauty brands globally. In this picture here though, from this year, we see that it's not really grown in the past year. It's actually just stalemated and who knows we'll see where it goes from there there are quite a few class action lawsuits allegedly so we will see what happens with that Monet is now the largest premium hair care company in the world and launched a skincare line in late 2019 to a substantial applause from its consumer base and beauty publications around the world here's the deal with this saying that it's the largest premium hair care company in the world I actually emailed Monet and they told me it was not that that is not something that they have said so why it's on here I have no idea I have not been able to find that other than the distributors writing it. There's not like a largest premium hair care company out there. Maybe they mean a direct selling, but of course they're not going to state that. So let's continue. 2020 saw them launch a wellness line that already represents more than 10% of their global revenue. In-depth information about Monet and its products line is available at moneyglobal.com. If you are someone who is watching this and you are a distributor of Monet or you like Monet, please know that this is not a Monet hate video. This is all about facts and truth as well as my opinion in it. Just because I have a different opinion than you doesn't mean I am bullying you or doesn't mean that I hate you. I truly just believe it's important to get this across to you. Please understand that these videos are made to share education and facts with people and share experiences as well. So if you're watching this and you're already upset by what you've heard, before you leave a nasty comment, please watch other videos as well. Go through all of it, watch other videos, open your mind and step out of that echo chamber that you have been in. Also, I will take your hate comment and use it in a hate comment video. Thank you. There is another thing that he is currently doing or working. It says it's inactive, but it says from 2000 to present that he is president and CEO of this day management consultants incorporated. It is, <laughs> I mean, not really, I guess a large company. I'm not really sure what to say. This is what it looks like. It says impact this day, executive search partners, your direct selling partners. It has an email, a phone number, and there are two blog posts by Stuart McMillan himself. One of them is called Ride Those Horses. It is quite the read and we will go over in part two or maybe a part three, I don't know. Part two, I have a pretty intense video to show. So while it says it's called Impact This Day on here on the website, it says on his Indeed, it's This Day Management Consultants Incorporated. So who knows? It seems as though he's the one that started this company. I'm not for sure, but I think so. Let's read about it. This day management provides overall organizational effectiveness with the emphasis on sales and marketing distribution strategies for a number of firms in Canada and the United States. We are particularly concerned with organizations that are in startup phase or are looking to take the next step in preparing the organization for a new funding or new business model. This day's primary focus is on direct selling organizations and the high tech sector. Now that we know Stuart McMillan's first title as president of Monet, I think it's important to talk about his second title that I'm gonna give him, the interim CEO of Telex Free. Wikipedia says that Telex Free, a trade name owned by Telex Free Incorporated, was a multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme disguised as an internet phone service company. Prosecutors have described it as the largest fraud of all time in terms of the number of people affected. More than 1 million with victims in various countries. I do have a court document we're going to look through briefly and I'm going to put it below in my citation area, my resources area, so that you can read through it if you would like to. I'm also going to be mostly reading from the Worcester Business Journal that talks about it. It was posted on April 16, 2014. So I'm gonna flip back and forth, but probably go through most of this first and then go through the um, United States bankruptcy document. This is called Secretary of State alleges billion dollar Ponzi scheme by Marlboro Company. This is by Emily 
Machuchi. I hope I said that right. Masucci. I, I'm not sure if I did. I apologize, Emily, if you watch this. You probably won't, but either way, let's continue. Secretary of State William Galvin has filed a civil complaint against Marlboro marketing firm Telex Free, alleging the company is merely a veiled pyramid and Ponzi scheme, targeting hardworking Brazilian Americans in violation of state law. That's kind of a big deal for the Secretary of State to file this. Let's keep that in mind as we continue. According to the complaint, Telex Free has raised $90 million in Massachusetts and nearly $1 billion worldwide through an elaborate internet marketing machine. These allegations prompted federal agents to raid the company's Marlboro headquarters on Tuesday, the Boston Globe reported. Agents were acting on a search warrant, the U.S. Department of Justice told the Globe. The complaint goes on to detail the way the system works, with people making an initial investment of either $289 or $1,375 in order to receive online advertising kits that allow them to make returns by posting pre-written advertisements to websites through an automated system. But the 200% returns guaranteed to investors by Telex Free are a mathematical impossibility, Calvin pointed out in his complaint. According to Telex Free, 88% of investments made by Massachusetts participants were for larger than the sum of 1,375. 88%. Wow. Even assuming that only 50% of all participant investments were for $1,375, Telex Free would still owe $2.39 billion, a number that far exceeds Telex Free's reported total revenue over the same period, the complaint read. Earlier this week, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in Nevada in an effort to revise its compensation plan for sales associates and restructure its debt. According to court filings, Telex Free has liabilities between $100 million and $500 million, but assets of just $50 million to $100 million. As a result of the filing of the Chapter 11 cases, Telex Free anticipates that it will have the time to build a solid foundation based on a compensation plan that rewards sales associates and promoters for customer acquisition, Stuart McMillan, interim CEO, said in a statement. Galvin is requesting a judge to order Telex Free to cease all activities that violate state law and compensate investors for any losses incurred. Galvin is also fines against the company. No one answered the phone at the number listed for Telex Free's Marlboro office on Wednesday afternoon, and the voice mailbox box was full. According to the company website, Telex Free was founded 14 years ago and is a multinational corporation with operations in 40 countries. The company's headquarters is located in Marlboro. Now that we know some about what went on, I'm going to briefly just go through different points on here. Again, please feel free to go through it below if you want, but it is quite long and y'all don't want to sit here and listen to me talk about every single point on here. This company, part of the company was formed by Wanzler and Merrill and Carlos Costa in July 2012. And in 2012, Car Costa and Wanzler formed Impactus Commercial LTDA a Brazilian company that used the name Telex Free and marketed a voice over internet protocol, VOIP, service. So in 2012, the debtors commenced the sale of VOIP based upon what was pur purported to be a multi-level marketing structure that provided for sales and resale of the debtors' products through a group of individuals denominated as either members, partners, agents, or promoters. The most frequently used term for such individual was promoter. The terms of the debtor's business plan provided that promoters could receive several times their investment on an annual basis merely by placing internet advertisements and recruiting other promoters without regard to the sale of any product, a classic pyramid scheme. But in 2013, Impactus was seized by the Brazilian authorities and its operations shut down based upon the allegations that its operations constituted a pyramid scheme. In 2013, Babner and Associates, an attorney retained by the debtors who claimed to have extensive MLM experience, advised the debtors that their business plan constituted a pyramid scheme. In late summer or early fall of 2013, the debtors retained the Sheffield Group, a consulting firm with extensive MLM experience, to ostensibly revise their business plan so that it would comply with applicable laws. In late summer, early fall of 2013, the debtors retained Weaver, an attorney with extensive white collar crime expertise, and the firm of Garvey, Schubert, Bearer based in Seattle to provide 
upon information and belief, legal advice respecting potential and or ongoing violations of federal state law. Despite the shutdown of Impactus, the one that was in Brazil, on the basis that its business was a pyramid scheme and being advised in the fall of 2013 that debtors business plan was a pyramid scheme. The principals continued to operate their business in accordance with the scheme throughout 2013 and into March 2014. During the course of the debtors operations, the principals paid themselves and Costa amounts substantially in excess of $10 million. So now we're going to talk about a little bit about section two, which is governmental investigation. So on or about February 5th, 2014, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Securities Division, the MSD, issued a subpoena to the de debtors in furtherance of an investigation into whether the debtors were operating in violation of applicable security laws. Greenberg is gonna represent them in connection with the MSD investigation, despite the fact that the debtors business plan was illegal and that the debtors Brazilian affiliate operating under a similar model had been shut down by the Brazilian government and investigations by the MSD and the SEC were ongoing, the debtors continued to solicit and accept fees from new promoters and, in fact, approximately $50 million was taken from new and existing promoters between early February 2014 and mid-March 2014. Oh, my gosh, in March 2014, the debtors retained Stuart McMillan as a consultant and later as interim chief executive officer. So now in March 2014, which is more than six months after it was advised that its business constituted as a pyramid scheme, the debtors introduced a modified plan to promoters that ostensibly would take effect March 2014. The modified plan reportedly would remedy the illegality of the existing plan and address the trailing liabilities under the existing plan that was exceeded five billion dollars <laughs> that exceeded five billion dollars oh my gosh within days of the modified plans attempts at implementation it was clear that it was also a pyramid scheme so around april 3rd 2014 sheffield performed a stress test of the revised plan and concluded that it was unsustainable in that promised payouts to the promoter substantially exceeded revenues from actual product sales. Oh my goodness, this is so intense. Upon information and belief, the modified plan was rejected by promoters who alleged, among other things, that the VOIP service was difficult or impossible to sell. In order to appease disgruntled promoters, the debtors apparently paid out $58 million to promoters and others, as yet undetermined in late March, early April 2014, on account of obligations under the previous plan. Now, section three, we're going to talk about preparation for bankruptcy filings. This is where it gets even more interesting. Why do they file bankruptcy? Well, this is what the court alleges, that as the investigation by the MSD and the SEC were going on, promoter unrest and estimated $5 billion in promoter liability, the debtors began to prepare for filing bankruptcy in early 2014. Early April 2014, sorry. April 2014, Greenberg recommended that the debtors retain Alvarez and Marshall, a &M, to serve as financial advisors. They were designated by the debtors as chief restructuring advisors. So Greenberg, on April 12, 2014, attended the meeting for the debtors, one purpose of which was to authorize Chapter 11 filings. This was the bankruptcy filings. Also during the meeting, McMillan was appointed as director to serve the Wensler and to serve with Wensler and Merrill. These two people were two people who helped start this whole shindig, right? The whole um, telex free thing. So at the April 12, 2014 board meeting, upon information and belief, Greenberg observed that the modified plan also appeared to violate applicable security laws. <sighs> now we're on to the last part that I'm gonna really get into, which is activity during the chapter 11 period. And it might not be the last part, but yeah, it's pretty close to the last part. So in April, 2014, um, the debtor's principal place of business was in Massachusetts, but they filed their voluntary chapter 11 pension in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the District of Nevada. The ostensible reason for the filing in Nevada was the choice of law provision in certain promoter contracts and that one of the debtors was established there. Upon information and belief, the real reason was to distance the debtors from the pending governmental investigations in Massachusetts. The pensions were all signed by Macmillan. As you go through, it just talks about 
what happened, right? And there's there's so much to go through and I don't wanna go through all of that. Feel free to read through it. I do wanna to get to the part that talks about Stuart. So obviously, yes, it is known as one of the biggest Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes, you know, and that's just it. But on or about August 1st, 2014, the debtors professionals filed for their application for compensation. So let's talk about the Macmillan application. This is what he filed. Remember, he started in March and it went about April, May, June. I mean, it was about one month. It was really about March to April that he was most vigilant in. So the Macmillan application seeks allowance and payment of fees in the amount of $88,333.51 and expenses in the amount of $18,755.94 for the period from the pension date to the date of the appointment of the trustee. Macmillan held a retainer of $177,576.81 despite multiple requests by the trustee. Macmillan has not turned over the amount of the retainer he holds in excess of fees and expenses sought in his applications. Sought in his application. Macmillan also filed through his firm, Impact This Day, which we previously talked about, uh, a request for administrative expense claim, the fee request, which appears to be duplicative of the Macmillan application. So they go through a legal analysis of what standards for allowance administrative expense claim are, and then they go to the argument of Macmillan's services did not provide a benefit to the debtors, estates, and his fees and expenses should be disallowed in their entirety or substantially reduced. So I'm going to read through that really quick and we'll kind of get a better idea of what he did and what went on. So as set forth herein, Macmillan was retained by the debtors as a consultant in March, 2014, and served with the principals of at least one month prior to the bankruptcy filings. Macmillan appears to have been involved in the inexplicable decision to pay out more than $58 million to promoters and others in late March, early April, 2014, on account of the prior business plan after the modified plan had supposedly been implemented. While professing that the debtors had a viable business worth saving, Macmillan told them that they had a viable business worth saving. Macmillan was unable at the evidentiary hearing on the venue motion to demonstrate any meaningful insight into the debtors business or the industry general. Generally, excuse me. Macmillan was not a VOIP specialist. He did not know who the debtors competitions competitors were, nor their price points. He did not know how much of the debtors $1 billion in so-called revenues in 2013 were actual cash revenues as opposed to merely credits being exchanged between the debtors and promoters in the back office accounting system. The Nevada Bankruptcy Court found him and Runge to have little knowledge of the debtors affairs at all. They just didn't really know what was going on. Pretty much in my opinion, it kind of seems he was there for the money. While Macmillan might have arguably been able to provide some benefit to the debtors' estates as interim chief executive officer when the debtors had assets and authority to operate, once the assets had been seized and the restraining order entered two days after the bankruptcy filings, Macmillan's role was reduced to little more than a figurehead. Macmillan seeks payment of more than $100,000 for presiding over a non-existent business. Holy crap. <laughs> Macmillan has not provided any detail or description of services that he allegedly provided or benefit ostensibly conferred upon the states from the services. To the extent that Macmillan was involved or directed the debtors in their opposition to the government's efforts, to the trustee, mo trustee motion, or to the venue motion, then not only did Macmillan not confer a benefit upon the estates, but indeed his actions harmed the estates through the additional costs incurred in litigation and the attendant delay in appointing an independent trustee to assume control of the debtor's liquidation. Certainly, with respect to services rendered between the time venue was transferred on May 9, 2014 and the appointment of the trustee on June 6, 2014, 
which fees totaled approximately $50,000, Macmillan Services provided no discernible benefit to the debtor's estates. It is unclear to whom Macmillan, as interim chief executive officer, was reporting to or whose services he was directing. With respect to his reporting obligations as chief executive officer, it seems unlikely that he had significant responsibilities because Merrill was incarcerated and Wanzler was a fugitive from justice. With respect to Macmillan's responsibility to manage personnel, it does not appear that any employees remained after the restraining order entered and asset seizure was affected, nor does it appear that there were any business decisions to be made since there was no business. Under these circumstances, Macmillan's request to be paid approximately $88,000 in fees and approximately $18,000 in expenses should be disallowed in their entirety or substantially reduced. As Macmillan has failed to satisfy his burden respecting allowance of his fees and expenses, the fee request filed by Impact This Day Incorporated should be disallowed as duplicative of the Macmillan application. So the conclusions of this were the fees and expenses sought by Macmillan should be disallowed or substantially reduced because Macmillan has failed to meet his burden of demonstrating that such costs are allowed administrative expenses. And feel free to go through and read the rest, but oh my gosh. So pretty much, in my opinion, what I read, Macmillan was supposed, supposed to come in and help them and he didn't and he wants to get paid for it. He very likely knew that this was a pyramid scheme. I mean, how could you not? How could you not? And he put his name to it. He was supposed to help them. He didn't. I think he wanted a payday, in my opinion. But I don't think he got it. I'm not really sure. Um, it, it seems as though he didn't towards the end. Uh, but again, I don't have the complete final facts. So feel free to go through it and decipher it yourself if you would like. <laughs> my dog is so excited because my husband just got up and walked around. You're so cute. Anyway, so <laughs> his second title is Stuart McMillan, interim CEO of Telex Free, the pyramid scheme. We can't forget this, that this guy who is a president of supposedly a huge MLM company that by the way, does have several class action lawsuits allegedly, was also a huge part of a Ponzi scheme. This is not okay. I am very surprised. But as we see that this ended, well, it didn't end, but like essentially did around August, 2014, he started in Monate, September of 2014. They had to have known that this guy who they wanted to become their president, who became their president, was a part of a pyramid Ponzi scheme. I'm sorry, what? They knew this, they knew this. And I think, I think in my opinion, and yet they still hired him. But wait, it gets better. This third section we're gonna talk about is not so much as serious as the last one we just talked about or as long, but essentially, <laughs> we think that Stuart McMillan made a troll account and trolled people in the anti-MLM atmosphere for a while. Let's see why we think that. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty simple. So the anti-MLM advocate really did a whole great post about this, but uh, she says, hmm, hey, at McMillan, a at McMillan Stewart and at Trolling the Trolls 2021, because at Trolling the Trolls 2021 was who was trolling a bunch of people. Why do you guys have the same email when I asked a follower to check? That's weird. That's suspicious. So if you see, in the, you can see right here, uh, Stu's main account, there's that email, the troll account, Stewart's email. Stu, if you're going to troll, change your email, bro. So the third name or the third title I have for Stu is Trolling the Trolls 2021. Mm. Let's see what the Trolling the Trolls looked like for Stu. Again, this happened to quite a few people and this is just an instance that we're gonna talk about today. If he trolled you, please comment below and tell me what the experience was. I would love to know. 
Trolling the Troll 2021 account says, if you were in one of the MLMs you make fun of, you wouldn't um, look like you do. Girl, wash your face and probably hair. Stuart, it's interesting that you're talking about someone washing their hair. Thanks, bestie. Self-care is super important. Good thing I'm planning on showering tonight. Aw, babe. I'm sorry that you don't understand the difference between anti and advocate. 843 followers. Bless your heart. By the way, this is trolling the trolls speaking. Maybe spend your efforts on something positive and maybe you'll attract the attention of more than the average direct seller gets to show up for a birthday party. Hashtag wasting your time. Of course, you probably have nothing better to do. Stu, did you just say aw, babe? What the hell? <laughs> this person replied, at least I have the balls to show my name and face, unlike you, hiding behind a troll profile. So if anti and advocate can't coexist, then I guess you can't be an anti-racist advocate or an anti-genocide advocate. You can come after me with personal attacks all you want. You're giving me some great content. Anyway, how's recruiting going? Again, trolling the trolls. Let's just say better than you are doing. Bless your pitiful heart, sweetie. Now the anti mlm advocate, and you're a coward who's profiting off the losses of other people. Trolling the trolls. All the people I'm taking on trips around the world so celebrating their success and enjoying our families together will disagree with you. You are just jealous because your life is tied to the pathetic attempt to pull down others. You are the epitome of a loser. You know, in my personal opinion, I think the epitome of a loser is exactly what Stuart did here. Show your face when you say it, Stu. Anti-MLM advocate said, LMAO, I'm sure they would. They're just as brainwashed as you are. Besides, you could be lying about your success since I have no way of knowing who you are. What do you think is a bigger waste of time? And then she continues in another screenshot, knowing who you are. What do you think is a bigger waste of time? Advocating for people who have been screwed over by people like you or trolling people because you don't like what they have to say. Seems to me like you're the one wasting your time. Trolling the troll says, I do this in my spare time and I get to... I get joy out of pointing out how pathetic you are. Stu, you get joy out of bullying people and being an absolute disgusting human? It makes sense. anti mlm advocate said, and yet you have avoided all the points I have made. You can call me pathetic, jealous, a loser, a bully, but at least I'm not a liar. Notice the double standard you just set up. You tell me I'm wasting my time as if I'm not doing this in my spare time, just like you. After she posted this, this was her caption. Come on, Stuart, this is embarrassing. Shouldn't you be more concerned with the gigantic PR crisis you have going on? You know, the proof of your distributors buying their own ranks. Oh, also the proof of them being racist, fat phobic. Hmm, there's so much more. Not only do you slide into our DMs and comment sections with harassment, you make assumptions about people's wealth just because they associate with the anti MLM movement. I'm sorry, but huh? It's all so gross. Disclaimer, this is all speculation as of now. I have no way of 100% confirming who is sending these messages, but throughout several interactions with different creators, the troll account would continue to respond until we questioned if he was Stuart McMillan, as you can see from my screenshots. I even gave him a chance to say, hey, I'm not Stuart. I can't say I would have believed him, but I certainly wouldn't be making this post. Thanks to my beautiful friend, anti MLM boss, babe, shout out. We were able to see that the emails attached to both accounts match up, and we all know that this isn't the first time Stuart has hid behind anonymous profiles to go after creators. It's too much of a coincidence to not be him at this point, but I'm always happy to be proven wrong. So while yes, he is the president of money, he also holds the title of interim CEO, a telex free, a known pyramid scheme, and trolling the trolls 2021. I don't know what else to say, but that's what we know about Stuart McMillan, that his profile on Instagram, his McMillan Stuart profile email matched that of trolling the trolls 2021. If you're gonna try to troll or you're gonna try to bully, do whatever you did, do it better. If you're going to try to lie and hide behind something, do it better, Stu. You did a piece of shit job, honestly. It was so easy to figure out from them just looking at the email. And good to the anti-MLM advocate and anti-MLM boss babe and those who were a part of this. 
I remember watching it, but I was not a part of it. And I think it was incredible to see the way that they worked together to figure this out and finally shut Stu up. So that's it for part one. I'll see you in part two. Thank you.